Hey everybody, I'm Eric Gerlach, and this is a talk on modern European philosophy, rationalism, and Leibniz, everybody's favorite crazy guy. Either that or David Lynch, you know, depending on what kind of haircut you like. So, again, if you look at the classic portrait of Leibniz, won't somebody tame him or his curls ladies? You know, he's got quite the wig. So, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz lived from 1646 to 1716. He is one of the more interesting Central European early modern philosophers. Early modernity is sometimes, as it's called, kind of the 16th, 1700s, and then you kind of have modernity in the late 17, 1800s, kind of, and then we may or may not live in postmodern times. So Leibniz was a German philosopher and mathematician who invented calculus uh, or something like it about the same time as Newton. Not sure who, it would be weird if they both called it calculus at the same time. I'd have to look that up, wouldn't it? That'd be quite the coinkydink, other than the calculus. And we still use his system of notation. Funny enough, uh, Newton tried to name everything after himself, and while there still is the Newton, that's why we go with Leibniz, funny enough, because, of course, as we know, scientists are objective and rational about things. That's publishing. Still, you know, the presses have improved. Well, not according to some. So... His Leibniz, back to him's first job was as an alchemist assistant, because of course he and Newton were doing a lot of alchemy. How did all that turn out? As modern chemistry, plenty in ways, uh, and all that plenty from China through Islam. And then Leibniz became a lawyer's assistant, perhaps working better alchemies. Magic, esoteric, you know, uh, precedence. As also method, uh, or uh, products, you know what I mean? How much is distilled? As also mentioned, he met Spinoza, as I mentioned in the last talk. And though the two disagreed on much, Leibniz is known to have borrowed, pa possibly plagiarized, wholesale ripped off parts of Spinoza's ethics. The thing is, at the time, people more just cut and pasted words, and that was kind of going with official writing. As I already mentioned, you can see, as writing first becomes a thing, it's like, well, you don't want to put everything in print that's not proper, what you put in print should be important subjects, and then actually taking blocks of other things and putting them in things is like nice official writing. We very much write much more so and independently and, in, and individually, where that is just straight up ripping somebody else off. That wasn't how it was thought of so much, you can see, but it could have been a bit. This isn't that that was totally okay, so in fact it's debated how much Spinoza was cool with that. Because he wasn't entirely. Leibniz published little during his lifetime, and to this day no definitive collection exists of his various and disparate writings. His most famous writings are his monadology, he is going to say we're all kind of points in space and monads, uh, along with the big mama monad, as I'm going to say. It's a bit of the Tao, but rather discreetly. And his discourse on metaphysics. So Leibniz invented the binary system. In fact, he adapted a binary system or binary systems into a binary system still used by computers today, which may or may not give way to something else like quantum computers in some time in the future. It could be that we store everything somewhere in the folds of a walnut, and then we just have some kind of master scanner that can scan itself somehow. And if a walnut is an infinite surface, well, then technically there's an infinite amount of information there that's already encoded, which is something like a quantum computer going beyond little one and zero switches, as I'm to understand, and then there's math. That's hard, you know. I like math, but not that math. I've never tried it. So it's easy enough for me to keep going here. Leibniz was a cinephile, uh, an anglophile is somebody who enjoys crumpets and going to the pub, who's not a Brit, you know, so a Scot. One who loves, a cinephile is somebody who loves Chinese culture. Uh, Leibniz studied Chinese thought, at least that which was available to him, at least in the Latin, and he invented his binary system, inspired in part by the Yijing divination system. As I tell people, uh, Confucius was available in the Latin to Europeans in the 1600s. But the Yijing divination system in Chinese uh, represents things in terms of solid lines, which are male, and uh, broken or open lines, which are female, which then is uh, solid and empty, and those are the yin and they technically the yang and the yin, because the yang is the male. Um, so the yin and the yang, um, and all of that. 
the uh, so Leibniz binary system actually with the ones and the zeros and then Boole and I'm going to get to that with logic uh, in the logic class. Boole then is trying to and with others then invent what become telephone systems. He wouldn't know that. And then now we have this wizen to you through the interwaves. It's rather chill. So Leibniz was communicating with Christian missionaries in China, and he, like some of the missionaries, believed that Europeans could learn much from Confucianism that was in line with Christianity. Also an admirer of the Chinese abacus, Leibniz was one of the most important innovators of the mechanical calculator, an early computer which employed his binary system. You can see, and I include in the notes, it, there are old, and you can uh, googly, old hand crank calculators and actually it is something like a hand crank powered abacus and of course baby steps from technologies to technologies that's using islamic algebra and uh, equational mathematics through a chinese abacus and then a hand crank is the early computer that would be very much the chinese golden age leading to the islamic golden age leading to europe Again, understanding all of it is understanding more of Europe and everything else, of course, in context, which is just, of course, the situation right in front of your face, as I was saying to the logic class. And how you frame it. Again, speaking of cats trying to get into categories and cabinets. So... Like Descartes and Spinoza, Leibniz is very much known as a rationalist, unlike my cats, uh, and they are not pre-modern Germans either. Leibniz believed that God created the world as a rational mechanical apparatus. Again, I openly discuss these ideas. Some people love and some people are opposed to such ideas, and that's great, isn't it? that uh, we all have plenty of all of this. And I talk openly about such things you don't at the dinner table. And as we have, uh, the rationalists in early modern Europe, uh, <laughs> he's trying to get to other toys. He has been quite the character lately. The, and I've tried to be with him and haven't been enough apparent, you know. So uh, because of all of this, and because the world is a rational mechanical apparatus, Leibniz famously argued that this is the best of all possible worlds, which would really wow anybody who asked ye old problem of evil along with Epicurus. Of course, this would be part of that back and forth answering and questioning. Many people have asked, well, is there order or reason in the universe or in humanity? All of that, sciences, etc., art, you know, with the soup cans. Is this, you know, uh, going upward or ordered? And why, if all of this suffers so, or some do, and one of the answers to that is, well, this is as good as you can have it, and Leibniz somewhat says, if this is a mathematical algebraic world, much like the Mutazilites of Islam, very much, uh, but not entirely and perfectly, uh, Muslim early rationalists would say, that God's omniscient, this all has algebra in it, so this is all calculated effectively. Of course, there's other steps of reasoning here, but effectively, to fly over all of that and give it a, uh, a glance, is that God's aware of all possibilities, so this is the one, you know, and there's always other possibilities, as we can see. This is, again, inshallah for Muslims. Well, it's all going to work itself out the way it's going to be a bit more fatalistically sometimes for Muslims, um, that we choose this to be, you know, uh, well, God <laughs> chose this to be, there goes a cattail, and not the plant, because it's moving. Of course, uh, that's basic Aristotle, kids. That's logic. Of course, many who ponder uh, the problem of evil again are going to say, well, wait a minute. This was it is not entirely perfect. And what Leibniz says is, well, if this is God and rational, then it pretty much is. And I guess we don't see how changing one butterfly flapping its wings would destroy everything. There is the famous sound of thunder. The Simpsons did a treehouse of horror. Uh, and it's great to bring up right here, of course. Uh, I believe Ray Bradbury wrote The Sound of Thunder, a classic American science fiction tale, I believe written in the 50s, uh, possibly even late 40s, I would believe 50s, um, where people go back in time with time machines and they dinosaur hunt, but they're warned to don't step on anything, and a guy accidentally steps on a bug as he hikes off, uh, he hikes away from the trail, and he doesn't shoot the dinosaur that's about to die, the T-Rex, so that nothing gets affected in the timeline much. 
and then he accidentally steps on the insect, and then it alters the future such that everybody's slightly speaking kind of Russian English, and then things are more fascist. Guess why that was written in the 50s, you know, by an American, or sort of, and it's like, alternate future, comrade, and you're like, oh no! That's one of only several possibilities, isn't it? This was famously mocked in Invader Zim, actually, and I do like that manic a television show, at least moments of it, you know, and then I uh, get distracted. That in there, uh, at some point, they say, we're going to travel back in time, but don't meet yourself. If you ever meet yourself, a giant bear in a frog costume will destroy the city. It's actually a giant frog in a bear costume. I misspoke, you know, again, simple mistakes and possibilities here and alternatives. And hilariously enough, he does meet himself, and then they're playing on the swing, and he's pushing himself on the swing, like at the end of the episode. It's like, yeah, you've met yourself, it's great. And then they pull back, and of course, cynically in the cartoon, there's a giant, you know, there's a giant frog in a bear costume destroying the city, because that's what happens when you screw with time, children. And of course, it's like oddly specific. It's like, you know, why did that happen, as opposed to no one speaks anything like English, you know what I mean? And of course, we just wouldn't know sort of this is all you see in science fiction plots they're like oh because time kind of corrects itself it's like that's nice <laughs> rather than spiral out of control for no reason you know what i mean into and we see things spiral out of control in our limited rea human social reality all the time which is the only way we represent such possibilities or put them in fictions with interesting characters so it is interesting again is there pure determinism you know, are uh, Mutaza lights or pure determinist right? And is this the best of all complete determined possible worlds? If so, this almost takes, again, like Descartes, free will completely out of the world, although at least Descartes sets it somewhere else aside. Leibniz does too. It's just uh, rather strangely, as we'll see, because he separates all of us, you know, and, and we have to think about what we did. He puts a uh, baby a bit in a corner, is what I'm telling you, along with Mama Monad, although again, rather discreetly. So, like Descartes and Spinoza, this is all a mechanical, rational apparatus. That's how it was created. That's how it was designed. It's a Newtonian clock. God's aware this has to be the best. So, in a certain sense, um, Leibniz is trying to come up with pure deductive understanding of the world. Unfortunately, this means the world is very much not how we experience it. I bring up in Greek philosophy, and I already have talks about Parmenides. Parmenides says movement is impossible, which is, there's actually many things, as I wave to you, hello, Parmenides, and everyone in the audience, which apparently includes him. Motion is impossible, and then he's like, because reason gets into problems with that. Now, as I mention a lot for the Eleatics, which is Parmenides and his followers of Elia, which is sort of southern Italy, I believe, it's all a camp of reasoning you know, and elsewheres, that's, if, are they arguing that, and they're actually mixed on this, like with Melissus, who's a dude, who has mixed opinions about this, as an Eleatic, are we saying motion's actually impossible, or are we saying the mind is stupid? You know, if I tell you reasoning can't get to motion, hello you, does that mean motion is impossible, this is all one infinite perfect monad static uh, point thing? and difference and motion are impossible. Parmenides says difference is impossible, so like that these are two fingers is impossible, that I'm different from you is impossible, but motion is impossible, so this isn't just we all feel that group mental hug. This is like, no, why am I going through motions or talking to you then if time is actually an instant, is sort of what we're talking about. How is any of that possible? And here, of course, does Parmenides mean it's actually impossible or that's what reasoning would say, ha ha, reasoning is dumb, contradicts itself. There's actually a lot to think both, but then again, if he's a reasoning human being, it would look that way, and it's hard to tell, and he doesn't say it. There's a lot here where Leibniz actually says each of us is an individual point in space, and that's actually what it is. There's no, in a sense, depth, though it's not postmodernism, all is on the surface, just look, and that's kind of Buddhistic. It's more, no, that this is actually an illusion. Each of us are individual points that don't touch. I'm actually not talking to you, I'm just talking, and you're hearing me, but you're just entirely in your own mind, and we don't touch at all. And there's actually, each of us is a perfect point in space, which is a monad, is what Leibniz says. This is where his reasoning takes him with rationalism. And he's like, well, that's odd. And here again, while Parmenides, I always like to give a, uh, as Wittgenstein says, we can always leave the back window open, which is what we do when we say 99.999 and don't really count anything, right? In a certain sense, in leaving open possibilities uh, friend, in a friendly, like, happy way, 
Perhaps Leibniz doesn't believe this, but it seems like Leibniz believes this a lot more than Parmenides. Like, or at least Parmenides is remaining tricky, zen-like, and won't tell us. Leibniz kind of tells us we're all discrete points in space. This is why I'm making jokes about discrete. Not only does just discrete mean, shh, be quiet and polite and upper class and silent about, you know, all of everything that rolls or does trickle down, you know? But for, of course, discrete means split apart. Like, that discrete numbers, like, you know, that there's one, two, three, and those are not confusable. That they are separate. So, of course, he's chopping all of us completely apart. Anaxagora said in ancient Greece, nothing is split with an axe, meaning there are no complete differences between things. That's very Jain and Buddhist in many ways, very Taoist. But here Leibniz is like, no, that's all an illusion, man. And this is weirdly kind of like Heraclitus Parmenides. Heraclitus says all is change, all is motion, stability is illusion. Very much. Parmenides says all is stable, nothing is change, all of that is illusion, very much, which is weird. Very much liveness is like, no, we're points in space. Everything else is an illusion that God spun into ourselves in each point, which again, I guess that's the best of all possible worlds if we're told not to touch, and that's elementary. But we are the elementary particles of the universe, eternal and indivisible, like uh, Greek and Indian atoms, without cut, actually. This is a strange kind of pre-modern atomism, although it's, well, I would say social, but it's anti, you know. There's quite the uh, repulsion. Uh, well, for myself, you know, not for Leibniz. Unlike the ancient Indian and Greek atoms, however, uh, Leibniz's points are individual minds, I wanted to say, which he's hiding all under his wig. He calls the, all these monads. The infinite plurality is entirely made of mind, which means, oddly, this is like Barclay, again, we're going to get to, and this town is mispronounced for. It's like all is mind, but we're all in the dream of God. But this is that we're all in the dream of God, but we're individual point dreams, each of us. Now that, again, is not really we're all in the dream of God together, mental group hug in the mind state, and physical reality is actually an illusion, which is much more Barkley. This is not physically real. You know, it's a dream of God, which is why it feels more real than my mind and my dreams, is what Barclay says. No, 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 no. For this, for Leibniz, everything is actually in your point, you know what I mean? And others are other points floating in space, which possibly explains how much we communicate or how successful I'm being right now, you know? So, this is actually, now remember, Spinoza last time thinks we're all waves on an ocean. That's exactly opposite, isn't it? Now, Hegel's going to come along and say, I'm seeing opposite, I'm seeing different moves of mind back and forth as philosophy in Greece and modern Europe. And Hegel thinks this is all a Newtonian clock, working positive, negative, positive, negative, and negative isn't evil. It's that clearly there's opposite positions working themselves out in thought. I think that too, but it's uh, more popular for more post-Nichean kind of postmodern times to say this is all a jungle. Isn't that amazing? Where's it all going? Lots of ways. But Hegel thinks it's a Newtonian clock in the 1800s, and you can see why he would think Greek and uh, uh, Greek, and then Europe. Yay! What's important? That that's all working itself out and evolving from position and counterposition dialectically through history, and then along comes Marx, actually, who uh, co-ops and takes up that dialectic very much. So. But for Leibniz here, so you have Spinoza has an anti-dualist monistic God mind, it, and we're all just, this is God. It's like, no, for Leibniz, this is you, but that's you and not God, because God's the big mama monad. I like to say, it's like, well, how wide is that monad? You know what I mean? I guess it's the mama one. It is one and or zero, right? A little bit of binary uh, sort of things. I'm not going to make the jokes I could. And what, uh, so yeah, it's a, what Leibniz calls, unlike my sense of humor, is a pre-established harmony. Yes, I disestablished it beforehand myself, and now I'm still here. So, each is its entire universe. It seems as if minds perceive each other imperfectly, but in actuality, they do not interact, which perhaps is best. Yes, let's keep our hands to ourselves, because, and our feet, and our, you know, and our political parties, because it's actually all in your mind. Each monad was set apart and just created as set apart, right? Bang, you know, from the central monad, I wasn't there, you know, but then I was. And when the monads split and became individuals, they were set in motion such that they could all run independently, but seem to share a universe and interact. So in other words, we're all in virtual reality separately with the goggles on, in a sense. Space, matter, and motion are subjective phenomena, not objectively real. Note 
uh, except they run like a clock. So this is still Newtonian. Notice you could say, oh yeah, because space and time are relative for Einstein. Not if these are each independent Newtonian clocks. This doesn't have to yet be Einstein, does it? Not at all. This could be uh, very deterministic and not relative or uh, chaotic much if you get it, you know. And no, I don't pretend to understand the math those ways. What I do is the thought, you know, in history of thought, there's order and chaos. And then you can see in ways how this or that does line up with, as folks say, you know, in history of math and history of philosophy, these are that ideas and intermesh, interact. Space, matter, and motion are subjective, but that does not mean they're relative here. That would mean actually that they're just independent, you know what I mean, in each individual, because that's our subjectivity in itself. I am not sure how the main monad views all the rest, actually, nor I guess would I hear. And again, Leibniz, like Spinoza, doesn't tell us everything. He's already being weird, and he's in a time when you don't say everything about this kind of thing. This is already going to get you very much condemned, you know, no matter how German you are, you know, by the Catholic Church. So all of this follows Descartes insofar as it all can be doubted other than mind, and that mathematics is given as true uh, by virtue of the essentially quantitative nature of being. While there are similarities to Descartes, it is also similar to Berkeley, as mentioned, the idealist who thinks reality is God's dream, thus rational and algebraic, etc. And we are dreams within the dream. Except in this ca in this case, we are each having God's dream but separate, uh, which again, you kind of have a panentheism here because there is a superiority. It's not that Spinoza's were all equally the water. And God gets to have the dream and then dream beyond, and we are each part of, you know, but not the whole and just water exactly like. So each dreamer is derived from the original dream, each an individual dubbed copy, in a sense, again, and it can be as groovy as, dove, as your own dubbed monad can be. So, for it's a one off, you know, it's a real spin. So, note for Spinoza and Barclay, there is an underlying identity um, which allows the individual to be eternal along with God um, as an individual kind of Christian soul, co eternal. I'm not sure, again, if, uh, well, again, Leibniz, I don't know if he, Leibniz says a lot of things actually, and I'm not the, the expert on him. I'm not going to say anything about whether or not uh, monads can be created or destroyed, actually. I think they are created and then, you know, remain. But I'll just leave it right there. The uh, So, for Leibniz, it is the underlying complete separation, not the whole and the inclusion, um, that allows the individual to be eternal, in a sense. Unlike any substance, if he is thinking of the Christian soul. Which is an illusion, but unlike, but like the original Mama Monad and the thing itself as a big, big, or equally wide yet primordial soul. And like the infinite nature of the endless series of numerals, actually one, two, three, and then onward to infinity. Which it also then would be infinite if it's an infinite series, which is not exactly an entirely clear, and actually of course there aren't infinite people, at least right now, regardless of your theories of reincarnation. So it's also similar to Indra's net of the Indian tradition, a net of mirrors that all reflect each other, a metaphor that Leibniz uses, but in fact he may or may not be thinking of India, or it may be one or two steps indirectly, and he does not seem, when he says a net of something, of course, uh, plenty of cultures have nets. When somebody says it's a net with a bunch of connections, that need not be Indian, of course, but could be in a bit. Um, because, again, Greek and German thought have been somewhat affected by Indian thought, although people have not uh, been keeping many of the receipts on that and are much more into the Greco connection. So there are several principles Leibniz draws upon again and again. Now, these are actually one of the reasons why Leibniz is, as we just talked through, kind of a wigged, crazy person, you know? That we are picking his wig, you know, for several ideas here. But there are, and he picks his out in the morning, but there are several principles that he comes up with, oddly enough, which are important to rationalism and then analytic philosophy and other things like the principle of non-contradiction, which is funny because, of course, a lot of Leibniz doesn't make sense. And I don't know many Leibnizians. Maybe they're all in Germany somewhere, you know, holed up in Berlin. But he is the one who states things that then get called by those names, which are things we do, such as the principle of identity and the principle of non-contradiction. And he states these sorts of things as simplest, simplest kinds of 
parts of things. And then you and other philosophers can debate whether or not there is completely a principle of identity or a principle of non-contradiction. Called in and one of the core rules of logic, the PNC, principle of non-contradiction. If a statement is true, then its negation is false. And if a statement is false, then its negation is true. For example, if I said Leibniz is a logician, if that is true, then Leibniz is not a logician, is false, and vice versa. Now, Kant and Russell, I actually am going to do a bunch of more lectures on logic. The principle of non-contradiction is one of the things that interests me a lot, because I think there is and isn't a thing, and I do like Buddhism and other skeptical systems of thought saying there is and isn't that, and playing with that specifically, like identity. Think about identity and Buddhism and other things. But Kant and Russell, advocates of logic and the principle of non-contradiction, studied the work of Leibniz intensely, advocating this principle. And if you know analytic philosophy, you know it is decently Kantian, neo-Kantian, and a bit Russellian, you know, or neo-Russellian Gesundheit. In contrast, Hegel, actually, with the continent, and I've already talked about the analytic camp, which is very Kant and Russell. In contrast, Hegel argues in his logic that all things work by way of contradiction, of tension between opposites, because he thinks that's Isaac Newton. Think of a cat's cradle. No, uh, cat's cradle is the tangle of strings. That's also very Wittgenstein. But think of a Newton's cradle, of course, on the corporate desk. Click, clock, click, clock, you know, with two. That is something like uh, where, you know, what Hegel was thinking Newton is showing about physics and he wants to show about history. And along comes Marx, you know, as said in the Joy Alex, full Marx on all of that. Another central principle of Leibniz's is, is the identity of indiscernibles. I'm passing by, by the way, issues with all that. We are not. There's all sorts of time to talk about the uh, principle of contradiction and not solve it yet. It's like, again, who's this guy, Rorschach? Why does he paint pictures of my parents fighting? Contradiction. It's impossible, right? I think so. Mer, 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 mer. Yes. But we're going to skip right by that because I'm not going to rant and rave about contradiction right now. I'm not going to complain one ways about it, not two ways about it right now, nor neither way. What I'm going to do is just move along with Leibniz, and we're going to finish Leibniz out, and then I'll have all sorts of time to talk about other people other than Leibniz using that for logic, etc. In the Latin and otherwise. But another central principle of Leibniz's is, is the identity of indiscernibles. If two things are without any discernible difference, then they must not be two things, but identical, the same thing. Mill, in his logic, which is, I think, important to Lewis Carroll, actually uses this in the reverse in a bit. And he knows who Leibniz is and is a logician, and thus knows who Leibniz is and these things. And, and Mill disagrees, actually, about the principle of con non-contradiction and says it's just sort of a thing that often is true because human beings, if they're arguing intensely, one side is sometimes right. I actually agree with Mill and the more pragmatic take on contradictions thus. But it depends how we define our terms. If we say contradictions are impossible, well, with Hume, then why do we go around, why do logicians run around looking for them then, you know, if they're impossible? But again, we'll get to Hume later. But Mill uses this actually, and this is a powerful tool, and I'll mention that later with Mill and others. If two things you cannot tell apart for any reason, and many often think of something like the North Star, the, nor the Morning Star and the Evening Star, both the North Star, I believe, and I'm not a sailor, thankfully. You know, did I go from Tahiti to Hawaii? No. With Kentucky, That if I am, if I look at a star and I can't figure out anything in relationship to other things that's different, and then I see another star and I can't figure out how it's different at all, it's possible, here it's almost, you know, here it's like if they're in exactly the same place in time, slightly different, no. If they're exactly identical, then they're identical. Of course, there's sometimes in places where you'd already know that, but that's actually very useful, and Mill uses the difference, which of course would be simply the reverse. If everything else is the same in a situation and there's something different, then there's something different, which is a very powerful tool. In fact, Derrida is all about just annoying everyone with de France, and he, you know, in and out of France, which means he's just playing with meaning and being, and he's showing how you can constantly pivot from one thing to another thing. I think that's very Tao, skepticism, and Zen, and I like doing that not only with my humor, with my talks, but also with philosophy a lot. But just annoying people isn't enough. Of course, you got to give them something positive and a product here. You know, it is the mechanical material world. So 
in giving people perspectives, it is very useful to think now, how are things the same? How are they different? And if we eliminate enough of the same and different, well, then that pairs down for us a bit of what's on the table. That's very good to think. I love that kind of thinking. So I like this in Leibniz a lot. You can always find things you like and dislike in different people. And sometimes people are thinkers, you know, though not all the time. How could they? So if two things are in different locations or exist at different times, that's a discernible difference. Of course, that automatically eliminates it if you see, unless they're uh, Indian yogi and translocate both of them and can be in the same place and time at once uh, a, la, a la Krishna, you know. The third principle of Leibniz's is, is the principle of sufficient reason. Now that again is a very important one for analytic and Russell and modern thought in especially the Anglophonic world. And this is actually good because for me, this is Occam's razor, but for Leibniz the rationalists, it is much more teleology. If something exists, there must be a reason why it exists the way it does. Now think about that. Now that is, I, I talk like that all the time and I hear other people talk like that all the time. And of course, when it's other people, I'm critical of them because in a certain sense, yes, there's a reason, but does there have to be a reason? Like, okay, a bunch of problems in, in exist in the world for reasons, right? And we talk that way. But does a problem exist because of reasons? That's actually sort of a conspiracy theory, if you think about it. Are there like reasons or like, haha, you know, and they're sitting there behind the stage. We can represent things that way. I'm actually sort of encouraging people not to think there's simple reasons intentionally behind horrible things, because I don't think that's very enlightening. You know, if you just think of yourself stacked up, are you part of conspiracies? Which conspiracies are you a part of? It would probably be more like how you lay, layer your life with others and then that gets terrible. I emphasize those perspectives. I'm not trying to cover for any conspiracy that's told me to cover for it, but maybe I'm simply being misused, you know? I haven't been told, you know, I haven't been schooled in on that though or clued in. So maybe that's the cue, you know? That's, uh, yes, that's the signal I need to end the lecture, but I'm not going to, which will show you this is authentic. And we can just talk through right of this, or I can eventually close the window and keep the cats in. So, and usually as with these things, they pass with time, as they have in the lectures, as we see. Yes, because we can't hear it. <laughs> And if it's nice, you say it twice. If two things are without any discernible difference, like nothing I can think of, then they must not be two things, but identical, like striking the same car twice and hearing music, you know, and the music of the chaos and the order together. So, if, basically, if something has a reason for existing, And it keeps having that, it would seem. It may not be intentional, you know? That may be somebody accidentally setting it off. Accident is, of course, uh, as Aristotle knows and then now doesn't, is the conjunction of several different things and then something comes from it but isn't essential. That that thing isn't always there, it just accidentally happened to be there. If something is essential, if something is core to something, then it pretty much is or always is there. If you're really an essentialist about it, more Aristotelian, there are things like a four legs for a goat always have to be there. If you are a bit more pragmatic and skeptical, plenty much, and I'm that, and I encourage that way of thinking, things plenty much have to be what they are. You actually do see that a lot, and people hate it, but that's life, unfortunately, especially human thought and reason and schools of thought, etc. So... It's convenient for me to say there's reasons things exist without car horns, thankfully. But it's not really that I or the situation of the car horn are reasonable. We're sort of getting by, and that was more or less reasonable. So it's sort of misleading, it could be, to say things happen for reasons. Especially if you think that, say, this is God, I was going to say right now, and God need not think like us, may think in terms of car horns, unicorns, or anything else coming down the pike, you know? And yeah, then you move someone's car, you know? Again, why do Guatemalans secretly move my car every Thursday? There's something wrong with all of them, I think. So basically, um, this is kind of a teleological view, interestingly enough. Holy heck, I am going to have to close the window after a little while because people can't handle... Well, there are spaces, you know, and I'm trying to handle mine over here. So I'm going to close the window on all of this. You know, it's going to be rather bivalent in a moment. 
So I've heard people refer to a teleological view as one that involves human purpose, but that's confusing language. And some modern people or modern thinkers seem to try to take the word teleological and make it, no, I mean like there's human purposes involved. I discourage that language only because, and I'm not criticizing the rest of this or that person's work, teleological in, uh, you know, it means or meant that the world's all intended to be that way. I was thinking and talking this over with myself earlier. I went to a Christian evangelical set of meetings with friends of mine. Uh, I had a Christian friend. I still have him as a friend. Uh, and we both have a Muslim friend. And I am philosophy person who thinks he's funny. And so we went to, you know, this. Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, it wasn't terrible. We went to uh, a sort of um, Christian apologetics set of meetings, which apologetics is not like we're so sorry. Again, in the classic Socrates, it is here. Let us explain stuff. And one of the things in a, that Christian evangelicals, much love to everyone and all sides of everything, say is that this is a designed intelligent cosmos. And so they have a teleological view like ancient people used to have. Now, what that means, again, in order to just sort of be clear about this rather than use words in different ways that then completely overlap camps entirely here. Teleological view is that things all exist. A banana, a class, they use this example. And yeah, most of all of what they were into, it's like, you know, I definitely like all that as history of thought and I'm into it, you know, and then you and I can think as we like plenty that a banana very much is intended to be eaten and used as a banana, which is why it looks like it does, is shaped like it does, has appeal, you know, to you and I and, you know, and the Cubans. But yes, all of this stuff. So with all of that, of course, some people are like, well, it randomly grew like that. You know, uh, apes poop out banana seeds, etc. And you can argue over whether or not there is a teleological intelligent design to the universe. So again, I equate very much in teaching classes teleological with intelligent design. And I unashamedly, as a modern sort of psychological historian thinking person, say... Well, people very much had this view, and we still do kind of, if you think the world's numerical and then you're also a hard atheist, that's a little weird for me, and I might chase you down a tiny bit on that to be a jerk, because I really like people to sort of think out how much we think the human world is human-ordered and has human purposes and numbers in it. I really like encouraging people to think about that kind of stuff, and a lot of times I will have people just full, you know, unashamedly say, well, I believe in X, Y, and Z, and I'm like, aha, you know, and I'm the jerk that way, professionally, you know, because I'm not outside. Watch this. Yes. Pardon the pantaloons. Now we're not outside very much anymore, you know? Here comes the sound curtains. Yeah, and I barely noticed it on, uh, on and then off. All right. Can you hear that? I can't much. That's great, you know, but I can. So I can't much. Otherwise, I couldn't. You know, the difference between the two. You can see it. So in the ancient world, it was very common to believe in, an, in a teleological view that just this is all set up very much like humanity. And I do love talking about anthropomorphism because th that is personal for people. You know, in many ways. But what is anthropomorphism? How does it work? And then I'm not telling you how much to believe in Thoth. I can't, you know, and I can't find the guy, you know, to confirm or not. So, yes, you know, sure. But at the same time, human beings have systems of thought. And a lot of times people ignore religious thought or the understandings in the ancient world as if that's not important. We have a scientific modern view. That's very destructive to understanding the point of view because you're just not seeing and feeling it the way it is. And not this is neither me extending an olive branch to, say, the evangelical conservative, nor is it even like, well, I know we all certainly think this way no matter what ways we think. But it is just very good and rich and historical. I find, of course, it's not a particular left or right that opposes uh, these views. But this is very much what people think and very much how Greek philosophers and Chinese philosophers think. I tell that that's one of the major links between Greek and Indian and Chinese thought, which I like, is that they did view the world in somewhat of a teleological way. And that allows you to make a lot of sense as a modern person of ancient texts. You miss a lot in Plato and Buddha, if you don't understand that they think the world's kind of shaped like a person and that's just kind of how they would think, whether or not uh, Plato or Buddha, and they disagree on a lot, say what you or I like. There was a talk by a grad student that I attended a while ago 
in which he said, and he was doing uh, work on a later Roman Stoic text, I believe it was written around the year 200 CE, this side of the zero mark, if there even is a zero, you can't see it, that he says that he went down into a cavern, something like Carlsbad, with a bunch of spires and uh, stalactites and stalagmites, And he was actually horrified, and he writes that he's horrified. And you can say, why is he horrified? What's wrong? And he says, and this was a moment of the talk I I really remember and have brought up so many times since then, because it's a great way of teaching intelligent design in the old teleological view, which isn't even so much the modern view, even of the evangelical, because we're just all modern, you know, more so, all of us. That he says, how could any of this down here exist if no one, this is so beautiful. This is also beautiful. How can this exist if there's no one to see it, is what he says. What the Roman Stoic is saying, and the Roman Stoic is very much, that's not logical, Captain. Along with Spock, wouldn't know that, you know, no matter how much the future is predetermined and fatalistic. And logical captain, you know, along with the logical captain, a.k.a., you know, the Lord Jehovah and the older speak. This all for the Roman Stoic, who's a bit more polytheistic, probably. The gods wouldn't create this much beauty and hide it underground. I have no idea what's going on. And that's a very interesting thing to stop and think because he really is, what the heck were the gods thinking? You know what I mean? And it's it's kind of funny because you could say, well, you know, there's just a bunch of beauty. It's not for human eyes or you can't see that. Well, no, it's just there just should. I mean, if humanity is the highest creation and if there's a bunch of beauty for humanity, why hide it? That doesn't make rational sense. And we live in a rational cosmos. That's what this stoic is saying. That's more of an old teleological view. But things all ought to make sense. You know, what the heck is going on here? I'll leave, you know, your political asides, you know, and all of that aside here, and as I will mine, you know, and I'll keep them uh, properly apart, a la the monads, you know, and you and I and Leibniz, even as his wig reaches out. So this, again, is much more what Leibniz is thinking here, is that, well, math adds everything up such that we're all monads, and that's perfect. It's the best of all possible worlds to be a monad, you and I, but not you and I together, you know, not without one and one making two discreetly. So today, many who do not believe in intelligent design still adhere to the principle of sufficient reason, which is odd, right? Of course, that's just a convenient way of saying, oh, we could come up with reasons later for this thing. It is interesting when human beings say something and they say there's reasons for this, they don't tell you entirely if they meant there were, there are, or there are going to be reasons. And that actually helps us keep saying it like that. And we mean it all those ways, but we can still keep saying it even if we don't think reasons led to it, because now reasons will be what we call it when we fill it in together. And we can kind of talk about it as if it all exists at one moment of time when we say this exists for reasons. What we now more mean as modern people is because you and I should talk more about it and come to a better explanation, which is all too human a bit. We all mean it that way, including the evangelical, because actually we all have a lot of science in our lives and telescopes, and we all know Alpha Centauri now is more out there and we haven't explained it entirely. So we actually have all adjusted to a reality which is rather existential, which is we don't all explain perfectly Carlsbad Caverns, but that's the majesty of God and or the universe and all of that, you know, and the mystery which is how people talked, but you can notice how the technology and everything and the perspectives and the text actually then inform all of that and are woven into everything. I do all the time, and thus I can be a jerk anytime I like, but I don't have to be, which is best, you know? I can be silent as a monad in space, and in space no one can hear you scream as a monad. I'm not sure what a monad sounds like. It's kind of like a kazoo, perhaps, you know? But it wouldn't be, because we're not out there. We're in here. In the principles of nature and of grace based on reason, Leibniz argues against the Cartesians by name that they were mistaken to believe that animals do not possess minds or have sensations, which is nice. However, only human beings, there goes that alarm again, (laughs) and you can barely hear it, which is great. Great. And where, ah, I still have got a sleeping cat somewhat, again, underneath the octopus right here. Yes, she is. And I don't know where the other one is, which is, oh. Is he tucked in there? No. Not sure. Again, somewhere baby shark. But, hope that's not copyrighted entirely. In the 
that yes. Again, speaking of animals possessing minds, I'll keep going. Only human beings, Leibniz argues, as a rationalist, now he is going to be Christian souls have reason, you know. And so only human beings with reason can become not merely souls, but genuine sublime, as he calls it, like the band, spirits. The empiricists, who we will study over the next couple of talks here, are like beasts, according to Leibniz. You beast, say Zen masters. Because they learn only from experience. So an empiricist is going to come along and say, rationalists like deductive principles, the idiots. Because, honestly, as Groucho Marx says, I, you know, I have principles. And if you don't like them, well, I have others. Because I've empirically learned differently by induction, you know? Uh, yeah, how is it? Again, if you stew cranberries like applesauce, it tastes more like pr uh, prunes than rhubarbs does. Now you tell me what you know, says Groucho Marx, because A to B to C to D to E, you know? I mean, and then you get an F. So... Basically, the empiricists are going to say, but science is teaching us so much, we can't stick to rationalist principles. What are you fools, you know, in principle? So, basically, Leibniz says against them, as he's talking smack back against the smack talkers, he says in his camp and team, unlike the Eliatics, that you guys only learn from experience and you never deduce rational principles like non-contradiction, which I've already contradicted, and like the identity of indiscernibles, which kind of goes back and forth with itself. So... He says, dogs are afraid of a stick with which they have been beaten. So he's like, you guys are mere beasts. You just get beaten up by false and you're afraid of truth. So you don't come to true principles is what he says about people who use too much induction rather than deducing from the true rules. But of course, what is the more one could say to stand in their camp, open-minded empiricist who learns by induction going to say, well, you're sticking to your principles and now they're yours and, and good night, everybody, you know? So they're not open enough to see what's coming along X and not X. They are just thinking X, 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 and they're not thinking X, not X, not X, X, and they're not seeing it. So they can't see the difference. Like that, again, by which you can see easily the difference. Yes, and I'm not going to turn it around for you or simplify that. So uh, perhaps, again, the empiricists do not become sublime like the band, above the beasts through the use of pure reason, which was not entirely like the band. So, like the rationalists themselves, though, such as Leibniz himself, which may or may not, again, be in Long Beach, you know, and much love to everyone, you know, and the shipping lanes, and all of the all-too-human practices beyond all of our all-too-rational principles. That is Leibniz, and much happiness, many wigs to those who wish them, and again, I will see you and Leibniz's wig, it's hard to miss it, when and if I ever see you. Provided, of course, there's sufficient reason. <laughs>